the 2050 opportunity. Shaping cities of our future. Mm. Well, firstly, I'd like to thank you all for the privilege of your time and attention as I tackle this big subject. And a big thank you to the organizers of Cityscape for inviting me here today to talk to you about the future of our cities and to inspire you on all of the possibilities. So today, we live in a world that is global and exponential. We're hyper-connected to everywhere thanks to the internet. Today, we live in a world of the most advanced technologies, humanoid robotics, mixed reality, generative AI. This isn't science fiction. This is the world that we live in. Today, there is more change in one year than our grandparents experienced in a lifetime. But I'd argue that since the launch of ChatGPT3, there's been more change in our life in, in one year than our, we've experienced in our entire lifetimes just in the past few months. So by way of introduction, I am a futurist and a thought leader focused on the trends and technologies changing the future of the built world. Now, I entered the property industry about 20 years ago working as an urban designer and an architect on mixed-use master plans in Sydney, Australia. And when I was doing this, I always had to ask the question, now how do I create places today for the needs of tomorrow? And one of the challenges that we have in design and development is that we're having to anticipate what the world's going to be like into the future because the places we create, they have to serve future generations. And the places that we create, they outlive us. So that poses the question, how will we live in the future? Well, I asked a genius, Albert Einstein says, if you want to know the future, look to the past. So let's do just that. If we look back 30 years, well, that's actually when the internet came into being. That's when we got email, we got Microsoft's Office, we got Excel, we had desktop computers. Today, of course, the dominant technology is our mobile phone devices that have changed the way that we interact with the world. And looking forward to tomorrow, there's going to be a change again. We're talking more about wearable technologies, using voice to control devices. We're talking about mixed reality. It's going to be a very different interface when it comes to technology. 30 years ago, it was all about suburbia. Today, because of the pandemic and people are working in a more dispersed way, we're having more satellite cities and more satellite CBDs. And the future of urban design is really around sustainable cities. Work in the past, we know we're sitting at our desk, nine to five, wearing a tie. Today, it's very much about remote work. And in the future, the future of work is going to be so influenced by generative AI that we don't even know what it's going to look like when we look towards 2050. 30 years ago, everybody wanted a car, the best car they could find. Today, it's about EVs. And when we look to the future, mobility is going to start taking to the skies. We're going to have more drones, more UAVs, a different type of way of getting around. Power the past, coal stations, today, nuclear. Tomorrow, looking at more renewables and solar, absolutely, huge potential. So what we're finding is that the technologies in our society change the way that we interact with the world. And I'm gonna come back to this point as we go through about how important creating that digital experience in cyberspace is to complement our physical space. So today when we talk about citizens and power and influence, it very much rests with baby boomers and Gen X. But when we fast forward 30 years into the future, that balance actually starts to shift because boomers and Gen Xers, they're actually going to be out of the workforce. And the new custodians are going to be millennials, Gen Zs, alphas, and generations that come after. So when we're creating places for the future, we have to understand what is it that they want and how do we create cities for them? So let's talk for a moment about Gen Z. I love talking about Gen Z. They're born between 97 and 2012, and they're particularly interesting for a few reasons. Firstly, they're the first generation to have never known a world without the internet. Imagine that. So everything they do is a digital first experience. So we can learn about the way that they interact with the world through their devices, most definitely, but also what they do provides clues to what other digital native generations will start to expect. 
So I'm going to highlight just some of the attributes. I don't have enough time to go through it all. You know, for one thing, we know they're communicaholics. They're always on their devices, on TikTok, on social media, sharing what's happening in their world. They're entrepreneurial. They're not interested in a lifetime career at one company. They're having side hustles, selling sneakers or creating things or being influencers, a very different way of working. Doing products as services is another thing. Not necessarily owning a car, but perhaps catching an Uber, that shared economy. And we know that they are very climate conscious. We've seen that they are eco-warriors. You know, and I love this photo. I think it just really sums up who they are as a generation. 70% of them spend more than two hours a day on YouTube. And why this is interesting is because it's the way that they start interacting with the world and having this self-guided learning. So really, really fascinating generation. Now, I don't usually talk about Gen Alpha, but I think in the context of this conference where it is so future-looking, I think it's important to start understanding some of the attributes that make them very special and unique. So Gen Alpha were born between 2013 and 2025, which makes them 10 years old and younger. So we're talking kids. Now, some people might say that people are the same everywhere, but I'd actually say that people are changing and they're influenced by outside factors. So Gen Alpha is sometimes called mini millennials because they are the children of millennials. Millennial parents have posted their photos up on the internet and on Instagram since the day that they were born. Their generation iPad, they came into being the same year that the iPad was launched. So they've always interacted with the world on their devices. It's one and the same. That is life. They're also Gen AI. They're the first generation that's really being impacted by Gen AI coming into schools and into the way they interact with the world. And of course, they're Generation COVID. The way that COVID and the pandemic lockdowns influenced their upbringing, their ability to um, go to school and interact with other kids is actually going to change the way that they think about the world. In fact, today, 24% of Gen Alphas spend more time online with their friends than they do in person. And that's why I say that digital experience that we create for them is so important because they're spending time online even more so in some instances than they do in the physical world. So always make them complimentary. So really, you need to understand the needs of future generations or you risk becoming irrelevant. That's your future customer. All right, let's talk about tomorrow's cities. And this is actually quite a sweet image. It's, um, it's a Gen AI vision of Washington, DC. So if we do have AI designing cities, this is what a city might look like in the future. But let's get into it. This chart actually comes from the global engineering firm Arup, and they're looking at future technologies and when they think that they're going to come into full adoption. Now, there's two things that I want to draw your attention to. Number one, they believe that every single emerging technology they can even think of is going to be in full adoption even by the mid-2030s. The second thing is they can't even imagine what might be coming next. It is so beyond their reach and, of course, it's going to have disruptive impacts. Our world is going to sustain 9.7 billion people and by 2030, we're going to have our 125 billion devices. Okay, which is going to have to be supported by high-speed internet. We don't know how many devices there will be by 2050 because there's exponential growth, but what we do know is there's going to be a lot more devices connected than there are people. 50% of all new vehicles will be autonomous by 2050, and 50% of all vehicles by 2060. Definitely a shift to autonomy that needs to be accommodated. And of course, Gen AI will change everything. So. How are major cities being shaped towards this future? What plans do they have in place? Let's get tangible for a moment. Let's bring it back home to what our city is doing. So let's start talking about New York, the place that I get to call home. New York is a city that is always known for constant transformation. It evolves with the time. It's kind of like the sure of cities. Now, in 2022, there was the new New York plan which was released. I highly recommend reading it. And what it did is it actually laid out a strategy for what New York is going to look like in a post-COVID world and understanding that the world has changed and the city needs to evolve with it. So within the plan, there are three goals, 10 strategies, and 40 initiatives. So the first goal is to reimagine the business district as a 24-7 destination. So this means mixed use, it means 
uh, theatre, it means restaurants, it means entertainment, the nighttime economy, vibrancy. The second goal is actually making it easy for New Yorkers to get to work. Now that's easy, not easier, easy. So here we're talking about reducing congestion on the roads, improving public transportation, improving the frequency, new transportation infrastructure. And the third is around inclusive growth. So what we're talking about here is in generating inclusive, future-focused growth for everyone. We're talking about jobs, new industries, innovation hubs. We're also talking about an aspiration of 500,000 new homes, and many of those being affordable. So as I said, a lot of different initiatives. Um, definitely worth reading this plan. Just for time constraints, I'm not going to get into them all. But it's really been exciting because every week in the news, there's a new announcement about something that's being piloted or something that's advancing. So definitely in the next few years, we're going to see New York becoming a very different place, which is the reason I'm there, to be part of that transformation. So let's talk about London, the OG. London, the original, 2,000 years old. London is a city that is so complex. It's gone through so many different eras with Romans and you know, advanced skyscrapers, everything all layered over together. And I say, if London can do it, so can everybody else. So they have the aptly named London Infrastructure 2050 Plan. It is perhaps a very boring sounding plan, but it is actually a very exciting initiative. Now, if you're like me and you like pretty things, they actually have a six-page summary, which is really nicely graphic designed. Highly recommend reading it. But I'll draw your attention to some of the attributes that I found to be quite interesting, and there's many more. The first one is around data strategy. So they're actually including open source data for the infrastructure, which is very unique. And the thing about that is that it's going to encourage third-party app developers to create apps that actually plug into infrastructure, much like City, um, City Mapper, so actually encouraging innovation. The second thing is that they're going to make data available between utilities. So what this means is that different utilities in the city can actually start coordinating with each other. Fantastic. That's great. And a third initiative that they have in place is that they're looking at including sensors on a lot of their infrastructure to be able to monitor the condition of what they have reduce cost, reduce downtime, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot happening in that space. Um, they're also, of course, looking at transportation. So they have aspirations for 90% um, for of offices built after 1990 to be within 500 meters walk of a train station or tube station. And when it comes to residential, they're looking at an 800 meter walk for 73% of new stock coming online. So really thinking about transportation and walkability. They have a lot of creative ambitions. They're also looking at repurposing underutilized assets. They're trying to think, can one solution uh, solve two, two goals? Um, and really having a culture of innovation, which is quite exciting. And I'll move over to Singapore. I would be remiss if I did not mention one of these fantastic Asian cities. And Singapore really is a notch above the rest. So I know we're talking about 2050, but let's talk about Singapore 2030 and their Singapore Green Plan. So it consists of five pillars, being the green economy, resilient future, energy reset, sustainable living, and a city in nature. Definitely worth looking into. They are complete overachievers. Um, they aspired to have 50% more green space against the 2020 benchmark. They're well on the way there. They wanted a million more trees. They've already ticked that off. They're looking at bringing in agri, um, agriculture and agri-tech into the city so that they can supply more of their own food. Um, lots happening in transportation, um, parklands, they want every single household, every single household to be within a 10 minute walk of a park. So I absolutely love what Singapore is doing. So we've only got a very short time together, so I'm going to end just with a final thought. I know I've given you a lot of information, and it's that we cannot predict the future, but we can create it. And for all of us in the city space and in the real estate space, we have an obligation to remember that the places we create today and the decisions that we create today need to be ready for future generations that are going to inherit it. So I'd like to thank you very much for the privilege of your time. 
Um, I'm very active on LinkedIn, so please do follow me. Please do message me. Let me know what you've been thinking about, what you're working on. I'm also going to be around the conference all week. As much as I can, I'll try to keep the bright Nikki Greenberg green jacket. So if you see me around, come up and say hi. I'm very interested to learn from all of you. So thank you again for the privilege of your time. It's been an absolute delight to talk to you about stuff that I'm so excited about. Thank you kindly.